Uh, okay, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Director Subrata Mitra, High Commissioners, Ambassadors, uh, ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome to uh, High Commissioner Nancy uh, Lynn uh, McDonald of Canada, our distinguished speaker for this afternoon, whose uh, CV, by the way, has been uh, circulated. And also to you all, importantly, all of you, uh, friends of ISAS who have been for us, uh, for us here in this house, a uh, tremendous uh, source of uh, inspiration. Uh, this is yet another session of our uh, series, uh, Ambassador's Lecture Series, which, has, which is rapidly emerging as one of the flagship events of, of, of our think tank. Uh, the, the idea was threefold. First, uh, uh, discussions such as this, deliberations, are a reward in itself. Uh, it also certainly sharpens and hones the minds and intellects of all attendees. Secondly, because uh, uh, our speakers are usually the representatives uh, of, uh, of envoys of their countries, agents of uh, other uh, state entities, uh, this uh, stimulates interest in the countries that these agents represent and uh, helps uh, re uh, inquiry, research, etc., cetera, in, uh, into their role in, on the international matrix. Uh, and uh, thirdly, thirdly, and this is something that we were talking about uh, moments before, before this event, it, it sort of enhances, encourages a town-gown relationship. I mean, uh, a relationship between the academia, the university here, and, and, and the city without. I mean, we have representatives here from the business community, from, from, uh, uh, from Oxford, uh, no, sorry, Orchard, Orchard <laughs> Street, uh, as well as, as the scholars, students, uh, 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 um, and uh, academics of the university. Uh, today, we mark observe and celebrate a very special occasion. And this is Canada's 150 years of uh, existence. Though I understand there are cities in, 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 um, in Canada, Ontario, for instance, which is uh, observing the 180th anniversary, if I'm right, yeah. And so, uh, High Commissioner, uh, 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 heartiest congratulations to you and Canadians everywhere, including in, in this house. Now, uh, I can say this without fear of any contradiction, that Canada, Canada has, uh, the presence of Canada in the global system has, has been extremely, extremely positive in a myriad ways. I mean, Canada has made enormous contributions to almost every aspect of civilized, uh, civic uh, existence. I mean, whether it's gender mainstreaming, human rights, democratic pluralism, so on and so forth. Now, I've had the uh, pleasure and privilege of working very closely with uh, many uh, senior uh, Canadian uh, diplomats, Louise Frechette, uh, uh, Alan Rock, uh, John McNee, and others, and all of them, uh, you know, um, top draw diplomats. Some of you who, uh, who have exposure to, well, who are interested in international relations would be aware of this principle known as uh, uh, the responsibility to protect. Uh, now, uh, the gist of this is that, uh, you know, it's the duty of every state to protect its own population. That failing, this responsibility devolves on the international community, who, which will discharge it by operating through the United Nations system. Now, I had the privilege of uh, shepherding it through the, through the UNGA as what we call friend of the president. But uh, we are very grateful to Canada for Canadian policymakers, Canadian thinkers, for providing many, many of the initial inputs. Now, today, in these changing times, uh, though, of course, Canada most certainly puts its own perceived national uh, interest uh, uh, first, but it sort of, uh, it's committed, committed to multilateralism, an ordered global uh, 
uh, an ordered uh, global structure, etc. And uh, uh, not just in, uh, uh, in what's called the ideals of the West, as uh, some, some Western leaders have, have professed of late, but globally. And indeed, uh, uh, Canada calls its foreign office uh, global affairs uh, at this point. Uh, it's not uh, up to me to comment on uh, th this. Many, many observers of comparative politics today would see this in contrast with what is happening down under, immediately down under Canada. But it's not for me to comment on goings on uh, within friendly powers. Uh, I will uh, leave this to the discussions and uh, deliberations that will follow. But before that, High Commissioner, the first 30 minutes will be yours. You will speak, and thereafter we will have a, a Q&A session, following which uh, a director will sum up and, and conclude the event. OK. High Commissioner, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. And I would like to start by uh, thanking Professor Subhata Mitra and, and also Dr. Chowdhury for the uh, invitation to, to come and join this uh, illustrious group here today and offer some thoughts and remarks on, on Canada as we uh, mark our 150th anniversary of Confederation. Um, in Canada at this time of year, it's called the, the, the middle of, of, of summer, and normally everybody is out at barbecues or their lakeside cottages, and they're not gathering in an academic setting to listen to a federal government bureaucrat speak. So I was, I was hedging my uh, expectations in terms of uh, the, uh, the participation rate at today's event. And I want to express my appreciation for making the time um, to, to, to come. Um, had this been happening in Toronto or Vancouver, I, I hasten to say I would not have had as, as, uh, as, as nice a turnout. So, so thank you for, um, for making the time this afternoon to come. And I, I'm looking forward to the discussion. So as, uh, as I was chatting with Dr. Chowdhury at the Malaysian High Commissioner's residence, we, we noted, and as you've noted in your introduction, that it is the 150th anniversary of our confederation. And front and center of the celebrations in, in Canada this year is, uh, is a noting about uh, Canada's diversity and our fundamental objective of building a strong and inclusive society for our next 150 years. And in Canada, the message that has resonated and will continue to resonate is that we see diversity as a source of strength, not weakness, and that Canada, the country, is strong not in spite of our differences, but in fact because of our differences. This uh, is a critical component of what we call the Canadian DNA. And as our Prime Minister recently said, diversity is a fact for Canada, but inclusion is a choice. And this choice is guided by the many benefits that we see diversity bringing to our country, including higher rates of economic growth, better social cohesion, and tremendous cultural and civic benefits. It has taken a long time for Canada to get to where it is today. Inclusion doesn't happen by accident. It happens because of choices, and these are choices that our country has to continue to, to make and dedicate itself to. So decades ago, Canada chose to embrace a policy of bilingualism and multiculturalism. In 2016, the government welcomed over 31,000 Syrian refugees. And there was a conscious decision on the part of the government to try to include as many aspects of Canadian society in welcoming and helping integrate those refugees rather than leave it to the federal government to do it on its own. This was to build on the successful example that we had experienced and my family personally in the late 1970s with the arrival of many immigra immigrants from uh, Vietnam. And so the country made a decision to again try to embrace that uh, approach of having community groups welcome uh, the refugees in, from Syria. In terms of diversity, as Dr. Chadri also mentioned, the Prime Minister has um, made a choice to have gender equity be an important part of the Canadian story. So the Canadian Federal Cabinet is 50% uh, women. The 
Prime Minister has also stated that he wants 50% of Canada's representatives abroad to be women and also to represent Canada's ethnic diversity. So um, at least on the first half of that, um, I'm a beneficiary of, uh, of the, the policy. We are committed as a country to embrace and draw on our diversity to tackle challenges, both at a global level, um, right down to the local community level. It's not always easy. We don't profess to have all the answers, but it's something that we feel is important, and that's one of the overriding themes that we've chosen as a government to celebrate in this 150th birthday. We see at a time when others are turning to populism or us versus them mentalities that diversity and inclusion um, should resonate as a preferred Canadian path forward for the next 150 years. This may sound familiar to the Singaporeans who are here um, in the room, but also to South Asians, um, recognizing the extremely rich and diverse region that we're all living in right now. We value uh, this characteristic, and we believe that this makes us logical partners. So another theme, in addition to diversity inclusion for our 150th uh, birthday, is reconciliation with our indigenous peoples. Indeed, the history of the land on which Canada is built did not begin 150 years ago, nor did it start with the arrival of European explorers 500 years ago. Canada's First Nations have been living in the territory and country we know, now call Canada for thousands of years. Um, and, and indeed, uh, the presence can be dated back at least 10,500 years. And so as the country di embraces diversity, the priority to ensure inclusion um, across the, the broad uh, reach of Canada's population is, is critical. And we have had a, a mixed history uh, in terms of uh, our relations with our Indigenous people, and it's a priority of the government to put that on a better path um, as we move ahead. I'll just touch very quickly on the two other key themes for Canada 150. The first is youth. On youth, the Government of Canada is committed to listening and responding to the issues that matter most to young people. So our Prime Minister um, often seems to be younger than he actually is. He is in his mid-40s, although um, often people uh, uh, mistake him for still being in his 30s. He is also our Minister of Youth, and he's created a Prime Minister's Youth Council. So he specifically is reaching out to young Canadians to give him advice on national issues as well as global issues, employment, access to education, climate change, etc. And again, um, we see the emphasis on youth uh, as a commonality we have with many countries in South Asia. Um, particularly, I was speaking with our High Commissioner in Delhi who said that the youth population of India and the focus on youth in Canada is something that he, he has um, particularly noticed and built on during his time um, in his position. And finally, environment, um, recognizing climate change affecting all of us. In, in Canada, that means that the ice roads in the north are melting. Uh, our Prince Edward Island, the smallest uh, one of small province, is, is actually shrinking because of erosion. We're having more forest fires in my home province of British Columbia. It's pretty uh, uh, incredible and not in a good sense as what's happening there right now, and floods. So Canada as a country recognizes that strong action is needed to address climate change and grow a green economy. The government announced $2.65 billion to help developing countries tackle climate change, and we're also working to stimulate innovation, green growth, resource efficiency, infrastructure, and clean technology. It's a challenge. It's also an opportunity to be part of the clean energy revolution. So these are the overriding themes of Canada 150, both domestic to try and shape our identity as we move ahead to our next 150 years, but also a global message. And this has been transformed or shaped, sort of um, expanded on in the release of three key policy statements that came out from the government this year. Some you may have heard bits about, um, perhaps not for others, so I'll, I'll just refer briefly for those who are interested, can see a statement um, in June by our Foreign Minister, Christia Freeland, setting out Canada's foreign policy, in which she reaffirmed Canada's robust support for the rules-based international order. 
and our intention to seek ways to strengthen related institutions and fora. Also to make necessary investments in our military to be able to back with force when necessary um, our values and principles. And the third tenet of, of her speech was to confirm that Canada is a trading nation and does not see trade as a zero-sum game. Um, and so we'll continue to be out um, in the world seeking to advance uh, open trade, progressive trade in the words of our government and support institutions such as the World Trade Organization. The second key policy piece was from uh, Minister Harjit Sajjan, our Minister of National Defence, who came out with a defence policy review. That was right after he had attended the Shangri-La Dialogue here in, in Singapore for the second year in a row. And that's a, a lengthy document, so for academics who wish to look at it, it's all up on our uh, government websites. But there, Minister Sajjan recognised the changing security environment and stated that Canada will continue to be a responsible partner that seeks to add value to traditional alliances, but also recognizes the need to step up our engagement with emerging powers, and in that he particularly flagged the Asia-Pacific region. And, more, and the most recent policy announcement from the Government of Canada, which also um, gained some attention in the international press, was the announcement of a feminist international assistance policy. This means that Canada will place gender equality and the empowerment of women and girls at the centre of all of our international assistance efforts. Based on the conviction that all people should enjoy the same fundamental human rights and be given the same opportunities to succeed, Canada will prioritise the investments, the partnerships and advocacy efforts that have the greatest potential we see to close gender gaps, eliminate barriers to gender equality, and help achieve the sustainable development goals. So that's quite a new way of looking at international assistance, um, and it's one that I can say for those colleagues of mine working in Global Affairs Canada, still trying to adjust to see how does that work in, in practice, um, but we're excited to, um, to, to take that uh, forward in terms of uh, international assistance and build on some of the existing uh, projects that are already underway in ASEAN um, on uh, gender equality and, and women's rights. So if you translate policy into practice or into action, uh, what, what might that mean and what does it mean for Asia? Um, I'll, I'll take a pause here though to say that again when I was speaking to Dr. Chaudhry, he mentioned there's always an interest to think of Canada in connection with the United States as well. And so perhaps I'll ask your indulgence and just um, touch briefly on the Canada-US relationship before uh, I turn to Asia. So we talk about Canada often standing next to a giant with whom we currently conduct almost three quarters of our trade. And we like to joke that when the US catches a cold, Canada sneezes. And I see my friends from Mexico in the back of the room and I think you understand what I'm talking about. The father of our current prime minister, so this is the right honorable Pierre Elliott Trudeau, said when, in 1969 when he was in Washington, living next to you in some ways is like sleeping with an elephant. No matter how friendly and even-tempered is the beast, if I can call it that, one is affected by every twitch and grunt. And there is a poster on the wall at Global Affairs Canada um, in, our, in our Trade Negotiations Bureau of a, a large poster of a, a circus elephant and a small boy sitting beside him. And that just is there, there's no, there's no uh, little, um, uh, what you call it, tag or explanation, but most Canadians understand what that poster represents and, and which negotiation that poster was up in the wall of the Canadian Trade Negotiation Office. It captures the imbalance of the relationship and the sense of both Canadian vulnerability on the one hand um, and sometimes American obliviousness to its northern neighbour on the other. But we have found great opportunity in this relationship. Canada and the U.S. have built one of the closest relationships between any two countries in the world. And this enduring partnership is essential to our shared prosperity and security. 
So like everyone, like you in Asia, now more than ever, we have to be alert to change and be able to understand the elephant. We must maneuver and calibrate our engagement bilaterally and multilaterally with more dexterity and strategy than ever before. When Prime Minister Trudeau, this is Trudeau Jr., not senior, met President Trump, they reaffirmed that together the U.S. and Canada benefit from robust trade and investment ties and integrated economies that support millions of Canadian and American jobs. We both want economies where the middle class and the working class seeking to join it have a fair shot of success. So this means for Canada standing up for what is right as a sovereign nation and for the expectations of our citizens on both sides of the border while also choosing appropriate compromise, innovative collaboration when the negotiations get tough. So that's the spirit with which we'll be entering the NAFTA uh, discussions, which are um, the U.S. has recently outlined its, its list of asks, and uh, together with our Mexican colleagues, um, Canada is seeking to engage in those discussions, not to unravel what has been a very successful arrangement, but rather to try and modernize and, and tweak and improve where we, ca where we can. But it also means, as a middle power living next to a superpower, we have a huge interest in international order based on rules. And as our foreign minister stated recently, in uh, one, an order where might is not always right and where more powerful countries are constrained in their treatment of smaller ones by standards that are internationally respected, enforced, and upheld. Also messages that I heard reiterated at the dialogue uh, in June here in Singapore. So I'll, I'll leave that for now on the U.S., but happy to engage in further discussion um, if that's of interest. Apart from looking at our North American neighbors, we've also set ourselves an ambitious international agenda, um, committed to advancing Canadian values and interests through leadership and constructive engagement on key global issues with strategic partners, including at the UN and in multilateral institutions. So this includes um, continuing efforts to address the conflict in Iraq and Syria through military training, security, humanitarian and development assistance, committing 25 or $27 million to enhancing the UN's capacity in conflict prevention, mediation, peace building, and Minister Sajan is holding a peace building conference um, in Vancouver in the fall. We also ratified the Paris Agreement in October 2016. And another way we're hoping to play a constructive role in addressing global challenges is through seeking a seat at the UN Security Council for the 2021-22 for the 20, term. So, so recognizing I don't want to eat up too much time, let me turn to Asia. Canada, um, you'll have heard this from our politicians, it describes itself as an, a, at once an Atlantic, an Arctic, and a Pacific nation. Emphasis and attention to the latter, the Pacific aspect, is growing. Five million Canadians out of 36 million are of Asian descent. Chinese, approximately 1.5 <coughs> million, 1.3 million of Indian descent, and 1 million South Asian. And those are from our Asia Pacific Foundation. It's, um, it's explained in more detail on their website if you're interested. Canada recognizes that Asia Pacific is a region with tremendous presence. Asian nations are playing an increasingly leading role on the international stage in the 21st century. Asia accounts for an increasing share of Canada's economic and immigration activity, and the countries of Asia are among Canada's most important sources of foreign investment, foreign students, and other temporary visitors. And in recognition of this, Canada's presence in Asia has been growing. Um, I, my assignment prior to coming here was in Hong Kong, and we watched as the Canadian presence in China continued to grow. Our mission embassy in Beijing, um, consulates in, uh, in Chongqing, Shanghai, Guangzhou, um, as well as trade offices in China. In India, our high commission in Delhi um, is Canada's largest diplomatic mission in the world and is supported by a network of eight consulates or trade offices um, throughout India. Also presence, of course, in, in um, Bangladesh, in Sri Lanka, um, and, and others. Expanding trade and investment with large, fast-growing markets, as, such as China and India, as well as mature markets such as Japan, is a priority. 
and that's why Canada and China have decided to launch exploratory discussions to assess the potential of an FTA, and why Canada and India are already engaged in comprehensive trade and investment um, agreement negotiations. Over a thousand Canadian companies are doing business in India, and inward investment has skyrocketed over the last few years, now standing at an estimated 13 to 14 billion dollars. Deepening links with emerging markets such as those in Southeast Asia as well as North Asia is a priority. We see lots of opportunity in terms of infrastructure. Canada has a lot of private public partnership um, experience, ICT, clean tech in terms of uh, our hydro, solar, water management, which has been quite a lot of interest here in, in Singapore, fuel cells, other advanced technologies. Of course, agri-food will continue to be a part an important part of our commercial relationship with Asia. And more now, um, Canada's growth in the areas of artificial intelligence and, and other um, innovative technologies. So both for commercial but also broader reasons, we've significantly increased our presence in Southeast Asia. We now have representation in all 10 ASEAN capitals, as well as a dedicated ambassador to ASEAN. And ASEAN's countries alone represent Canada's sixth largest trading partner, with bilateral trade at $21.6 billion in 2016, and FDI from Canada and ASEAN at $10 billion. So at a time of growing protectionist trends, Canada, as I mentioned, is taking a different approach and continuing to position ourselves to reflect our nature as a trading nation, standing for progressive trade that we hope will bring benefit to as wide a cross-section of populations as possible. I uh, would it, direct people to look at the um, some of the text of this CETA, the recent agreement with the European Union, to see what some of those elements might look like. In August um, of last year, Minister Freeland, then wearing her trade hat, announced the launch of a trade policy dialogue um, with ASEAN. That was held just uh, a couple of weeks ago. Um, and focused on sharing our SME experiences. There's also a feasibility study on an ASEAN Canada FTA underway, and we hope the preliminary study will be presented to ministers at the ASEAN Economic Ministers meeting um, with Canada consultation in Manila in September. We've also been a member or dialogue partner in other ASEAN groups, as well as in APEC and the, and the PECC, both the uh, close colleagues uh, to ISAS. Um, and recent um, ABAC meetings in Toronto had a focus on innovation and startups, etc. We are all invested in the continued vitality and growth of the region, but of course this also depends on its continuing stability. While greater economic integration in Asia is creating prosperity and new opportunities, we recognize it can also create challenges to the region's security as potential shifts in dynamics of power um, can sometimes contribute to conflict. This region is not immune to both traditional and non-traditional threats to peace and security, which can be disruptive. And the global political and security situation is more uncertain than it has been in many years. Any of us who attended the Shangri-La Dialogue are aware of pressing concerns, including tensions on the Korean Peninsula, um, new forms of terrorism, cybersecurity threats, natural disasters, maritime security. To meet these challenges, Canada believes that nations need more than ever to work together to find and implement common and consistent global norms, standards, and approaches to increase security nationally, regionally, and globally. Confidence building measures and preventative diplomacy is key. So in the Defence Policy Review, Minister Sajen, um, himself an Indo-Canadian, states clearly that Canada is committed to being a reliable player in the region through consistent engagement and strong partnerships. He adds that Canada will establish meaningful strategic dialogues with key regional powers to exchange views on regional security issues and threats to regional stability as well as participate in regional exercises. So we've had more Canadian naval vessels come through Singapore. We had three in the past year, and that commitment is um, will continue in the region. In addition, our Prime Minister in February said that as a Pacific nation, Canada has strongly supported ASEAN's goal of maintaining the peace, stability, and security 
that has allowed Southeast Asia and the wider Asia Pacific region to develop and prosper. So we'll continue to work closely with our longstanding partners on security issues, but also seek to increase our engagement not only through the ARF, but also we hope through eventual membership in the East Asia Summit and ASEAN Defense Ministers Meeting Plus. And finally, I'll touch on people-to-people -people ties, um, which often get short shrift, but should not be overlooked, as I think they present the fundamental underpinning of Canada's engagement in the region. We're growing the education and research ties. Um, I've noticed in the year that I've been fortunate enough to be in Singapore, uh, growing exchanges between Canadian universities and those based in Singapore and the region, more students traveling back and forth, also tapping into the diaspora that's present in Canada, both from South Asia, um, but other parts of Asia as well. To give the example of India, the growing community of more than 1.3 million Canadians of Indian origin, which is the largest Indian diaspora in the world on a per capita basis, and their contribution to our society is, um, is important. The representation of Indo-Canadians in government is at an all-time high, with 19 MPs, uh, members of parliament that is, 17 in the governing party and four cabinet ministers. And this is just one example, but of course the diaspora of Asia and Canada is, um, crosses uh, many different ethnic, um, ethnic diverse links. We're also seeking to increase air links between Canada and Asia, um, growing our, um, our tourism in both directions. I'll put a note that if anyone's going to Canada this year, uh, entrance to all of our national parks is free for 2017, so now is the time to go if you're interested, um, as well as cultural links. Um, again, uh, funding for cultural diplomacy has been increased under Prime Minister Trudeau, and so, for example, here in Singapore, we've brought over some First Nations artists. We're, we're planning to do an Arctic event um, in the fall, again, to try to share and um, contribute to cultural ties. So Canada is open um, to international cooperation. I think that's probably understood, but I think it's fair to say we haven't always been consistent in identifying our common interests with Asia. We have come and gone a bit from the region, or that's the perception. Um, and at times, I think parts of Asia feel that they may be an afterthought to our preoccupation with uh, our southern neighbors, the United States. But we see that identifying common interests is the opportunity that awaits us now in 2017. And we can find synergies in the common goals of economic prosperity, regional security, political stability, and also social justice and human rights. On the latter, as I mentioned, our new international assistance policy has a strong focus on promoting the interests of women and girls. We're already working in many countries on these issues, um, including helping with the domestic implementation of the UN Convention on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women. Um, but I think you'll see more of that coming in the, in the next year or two. So let me leave you, if I may, with three messages. Um, one, uh, Canada considers itself to be a Pacific nation. We have an growing engagement and investment in Asia. The relationships both bilaterally, regionally, and within institutions are strong, but we want it to grow to greater heights. We'd encourage um, you and your, um, with your, within your academic studies and institutions to consider Canada as a logical partner, not only in the commercial terms, but also in terms of a contribution to regional security, a partner in tackling climate change and other global challenges. Against this backdrop of positive and growing ties, we do feel that Canada-South Asia ties have yet to fully reach their potential, and our people, businesses, students, and academics have fertile ground to plant the seeds for future expansion. So let's do better at identifying the areas for cooperation. Governments can certainly do a certain amount to foster that climate of exchange and innovation, but it also depends on our citizens acting as bridges across the vast Pacific Ocean to help realize our common goals of peace, prosperity, and to bring it back to my starting comments, diversity and inclusion. Thank you very thank much. You. Uh, thank you very much, High Commissioner, for that uh, very informative expose on Canada as a Pacific nation in both the connotations of the term Pacific. Uh, 
Uh, I, I just wanted to say that under normal circumstances, or, or mostly, we uh, these events are are uh, come under Chatham House mm. rules, so you will not be directly ci cited, I hope not, by, by any of the attendees here. However, however, recently we have been encouraging uh, speakers and ambassadors to submit uh, their remarks thereafter in, in some form of a, uh, a paper, 3,000 to 5,000 words, uh, which uh, would, uh, among uh, other, th I mean, apart from enlightening us, uh, it'll please uh, Professor Mitra no end because he's forever, forever looking to expanding the numbers of uh, key performance uh, indicators. So, so we would uh, expect and hope that you would do the same. And you, you have some uh, very interesting written notes there, so it should uh, facilitate uh, this part of your task. I will now open the uh, floor for. Uh, for the Q&A session and begin uh, with uh, you, sir. Okay, Professor. Hi, Commissioner. That was a most charming talk. Um, a problem, uh, really believing that you are trained as a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have lost my argument already, as you can see. Um, I would um, like to talk a little about um, the um, whole uh, rhetoric about a, a rules-based international order. Now, you know, not everyone likes rules, and they have to be disciplined. So creating a rules-based international order costs money and costs efforts. It can be argued that uh, the little boy really benefits from the shadow of the elephant. Does Canada actually contribute to enforcing rules? And if it does, um, how about areas like the South China Sea, um, the high seas, the piracies, and the Middle East, uh, whatever, you know, there's a need for rules first order. Is Canada also present? OK, if you take that first, uh, uh, I'll encourage the rest to mull over what they're about going to ask. So you might wish to respond okay. to this first. And yeah. Yeah. Thank, thank you um, very much for the question, and indeed, um, it's it's a very timely one because this is one of the key points that was raised by Minister Freeland in her foreign policy address. Um, I'll get to that in a moment. What uh, what I'll say first is that contribution to a rules-based international order can come in in a variety of forms, and I would argue. That um, that while uh, military sort of intervention and weight is is one form, and I'll return to that, um, there can also be a contribution made to a rules-based international order by contributing in terms of policy thought and substance to the um, discussions happening within the fundamental um, institutions that form that rules-based international framework. And I would argue that. Uh, with respect to Canada's contribution to the United Nations, um, as well as where I'm more familiar, the World Trade Organization, um, there has been contributions made in terms of shaping, for example, the dispute settlement system of the World Trade Organization and ensuring that other countries, big and small, um, uphold their commitments to that institution. To, to offer ideas to move um, towards consensus across various forms that, that reinforce rather than um, uh, help uh, weaken an international body that, that forms the foundation for the rules-based system. Um, having said that, there is a recognition on the part of Canada that um, we, we have um, benefited uh, from living next door to the United States with its immense military capacity. Um, like I think a number of other countries here and others, we've, we've relied on the U.S. to do a lot of the heavy lifting. And Minister Freeland noted in her foreign policy address, and it's later reflected in the Defense Policy Review, where there's a considerable new investment made into Canada's military, that um, at, at there comes a point where you must also be able to put the, the, the force behind the, the words and the, and the conviction. Um, with respect specifically to your question on the South China Seas, um, Canada recognizes it's not a direct um, uh, complainant or instigator in the system, but we're watching very closely what's happening in terms of that dynamic and supporting in terms of trying to build some 
consensus on areas where we feel we could bring some expertise, such as um, to resolve the uh, the code of conduct for un unanticipated encounters at sea. As well, we've been talking about some other areas where we could perhaps contribute some ideas to help diffuse tension in in that in that area. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, well, you spoke of the flip side of the coin of the ru uh, rules order. I mean, apart from uh, security, uh, WTO, etc. I mean, a follow-up question could be: I mean, sometimes in order to to maintain a rule-based order, you need to temper with the rules a little bit to create an even playing field. So in, within the WTO context, what, what kind of privileges do you accord uh, uh, to countries who may need some kind of a special and differential treatment in order to, uh, uh, to be able to play a comparable role in the, in the trade system? In other words, uh, about market access or, or development cooperation area. Could you say something with regard to that? Sure, and I, and I, I will. This is where the lawyer comes out. I will caveat by saying I'm I'm I is, I'm a few years out of date with the most recent discussions at the at the WTO. But uh, in the past, uh, Canada has been supportive of special and differential treatment, particularly for at the time least developed countries, both in terms of their accession obligations to the WTO, um, as well as the um, some of the ad additional flexibilities accorded under some of the. Um, un under some of the obligations with respect to the ag agreements that form the um, the basis of the framework for the uh, rules-based trading system. Um, I think the idea is that ultimately it is often in a country's best interest to bring itself um, to the level where um, the, the barriers to trade are, are reduced so that the um, within reason, the free flow of trade will, will then help um, also improve the economy of the country in question. But we've seen a, 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 a need to, to show flexibility in terms of how far and how fast those obligations are, are, are reached. Okay. All right. Floor is open. <laughs> yes. If you'll introduce yourself as you, as you speak. Hello, uh, respected High Commissioner. My name is uh, Nish. I'm uh, from Scotia Bank, uh, and uh, we uh, are in the region uh, for several years. One of the few Canadian banks who have the international presence. Uh, so, uh, my question to the respected High Commissioner is uh, on uh, climate change, and uh, specifically with the Paris Accord, and uh, we see that uh, with the latest uh, announcement by Mr. Trump that he would like to. Uh, back out of uh, the Paris Accord. And uh, given the commitments from the other G20 nations, uh, however, if the elephant isn't participating, uh, if I may say so, uh, how can it be enforced on other developing nations, especially most of which, which, is, uh, which are in Asia Pacific region? And uh, what could be the threats and impacts which you see going forward on that, if you could. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and and certainly, well, I can I will ask for your indulgence because I actually brought along the statement that the prime minister made um, after the U.S. Uh, so one one moment, I will just uh, I will have this so I can share exactly the the wording. But I think oh, um, as an in, while I'm looking for that, I will say that. There's a certainly recognition on the part of Canada that climate change is is real. It affects us all, and so if one country decides not to participate, um, it it doesn't uh, preclude or prevent the the need for other countries to do what what they can, acting collectively or individually to to try to mitigate the the issue. It's in our own interest, um, and we see it as being a. Uh, a necessity. So there was certainly disappointment, I think was the terminology our Prime Minister used, and I'll find it, um, uh, in terms of the U.S. decision, but not seeing it as a, um, as a, to preclude other countries with whom we're looking forward to working closely with um, to, to, to move forward and, and try and address these challenges. As I mentioned as well, um, 
we we do see it also as an opportunity for Canadian firms, and this is where Scotiabank may also be interested in in terms of uh, some of the technology that can it, Canada has been developing in terms of of, of green um, green tech and clean tech to try to uh, address the changes um, and combat climate change, but in in a way that. Um, improves uh, life in in Asia but also helps to bring some economic benefit back to back to Canada some could call it self-interested but I, I think it, it could be a win-win outcome and I'm sorry I I will have to look through I I do somewhere here have the Prime Minister's statement but I think uh, that's essentially it it is disappointment but not seeing it as a excuse nor reason to for other um, committed signatories to the Paris Accord to um, to give up on the issue Okay, Dr. Dipinder uh, Thank you, Madam Commissioner. Uh, I have two questions, if I may. Yeah. Uh, the first one draws upon um, Canada's today seen as almost as a global role model in, in the sense of assimilating uh, our, our migrants from overseas. And um, if I may refer to uh, Jonathan Tipperman's The Fix, uh, he talks about. Um, the introduction of policy, major policy changes during Prime Minister Pierre Elliott Trudeau's time, where immigration was based on, on, on merits and the point system, not to pitch, and that was, I mean, not just one of idealism, but there's a deep sense of pragmatism that underlay mm. that as well. Um, the net outcome of that is an extraordinary social compact that you observe in Canada today, and that is across the political spectrum, be the left of center, the center, or the right, I mean, there's agreement on this. But as we're seeing in other places, in the UK and, I mean, uh, and uh, other countries, um, the fishers, if they're really deep down, they arise during difficult times. So recently, the three largest contributors, I mean, I don't remember the numbers, are China, India, and the Philippines to immigration, and that's changing the ethnic character of, of, of the country in some sense. My question is, is there, a, is there an evolution of a distinctly Canadian identity uh, where people are, the, the, the ethnic identity is getting subsumed and the national identity, you know, based on principles, is, is that dominating or is do you see a point of time in the future where that will emerge and I mean, it becomes unlike any other place perhaps on the planet. Uh, my second question is born out of uh, totally different uh, issues, economic issues. So I was at a conference at Laval, and this was on state capitalism. Mm. Uh, 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 uh. <coughs> and the concern was, I mean, there were quite a few diplomats from, uh, 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 officers from the Global Affairs Department. And the concern was about the large multinationals, particularly from Asia, uh, coming to mind, the tar sands in, in northern Quebec and British Columbia. And how do you address the issues of accountability of those uh, states? Say ownership is opaque. Uh, the strategic issues that they concerned, I mean, that arise from that are very different from private sector <coughs> entities. Although there was a diplomat who did point out that it's easier to pin down a country and hold it accountable than a corporate <laughs> entity as well. So it's a very yeah. loosely phrased question, but could you get your thoughts on how uh, it's shaping perceptions on foreign investment in the energy sector? Yeah. Thank okay. you. No, thank you. Uh, thank you for those questions, and I'll I'll take the the last one first. Um, <coughs> certainly, there, like in in many other countries, there there are sometimes questions raised when. Uh, Foreign entity is is investing into uh, a specific sector of the of the Canadian e economy, or as we see, um, it's happened in Australia, the UK, and and and, and others. Canada, similar to these other countries, does have a system for reviewing major investments um, for uh, sort of in the national interest, and within that can can often uh, insist on certain. Qualifications or standards to be to be met, including in terms of employment, um, in in terms of uh, transparency of the origins of the investment, and so forth. Um, does that work to diminish public concern? I 
I would say speaking honestly, um, not always. And and there's in the context of the um, the China free trade potential um, and the consultations that are going on right now. This is one of the issues that the government is going out to ask for uh, the views and contributions of the population to say, you know, what what are your thoughts in 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 this regard? I think there's a recognition that foreign investment has done a lot for Canada. We um, we have been able to use um, the infusion of foreign investment into Canada on some important um, infrastructure and other initiatives. Um, but at the same time, there's uh, when it when it comes to uh, being able to ensure that that ultimately the investment is in the, is in the national interest. Uh, there's an expectation on the part of the citizens that the government will do a, a robust and comprehensive review. So it's it's um, there's. I, I'd say an awareness, um, both on the part of citizens and the government, that this is important, um, and but also a, a, a recognition too that you need to do it on a case by case basis rather than have a sweeping policy of one size fits all. So we'll see how things evolve, um, and and I think there's also uh, appreciation of the fact that. Uh, with with a number of the investments, um, I'm, I'm thinking in terms of some that I was involved with and I was based in Hong Kong, um, the provincial governments are paying a large part now too in, in making sure that they get the message out about the jobs and the expansion of plants that are happening due to, say, an infusion of capital um, from, uh, from Hong Kong or from some um, parts of China as well. So it's not a always viewed as a negative, um, but it is a case-by-case -case consideration. Uh, I, I appreciate your question about the evolution of Canadian identity. Um, there's, of course, no uh, shortage of, of navel-gazing in Canada about what does it mean to be Canadian. Um, and I think as we get to our 150th uh, birthday, there's been probably more than ever looking at and a decision, I think, uh, to say, let's move away from um, always identifying ourselves in contrast to the United States, but rather kind of try to f come up with an identity that is uniquely Canadian, um, rather than saying what we're what we're not. Um, I think that's also a work in in progress. Um, but there's a lot of pride, as you identified, about the fact that we are a nation that is made up of of immigrants. Um, I think the the fact that that there's a lot of, of success stories in terms of the, the first, second, and third generation of immigrants into the country, as well as um, aspects of the of the way that Canada is is formulated in terms of um, the public health care, the public schooling system, other things that that help to um, help to integrate and, and mix communities together. That for now is is working, as well as the message very clearly from our our, our government. Um, I don't think we rest on our uh, laurels, though, uh, if that's the right expression. I think I think we're, we're aware that, as I mentioned in my presentation, that this is inclusion as a choice, and it could quickly be turned in another direction. And so, in a time of economic hardship, as you're um, mentioning, will there be um, a, will there be a turning inwards? I would say that the framework and the makeup of Canada is such it's hard to know if you turn inwards who are you turning to right now because uh, we're such a um, uh, diverse ethnic makeup now. Um, and I think there's also a appreciation for the contribution that um, our uh, immigrant um, new immigrants are making to the the fundamental economic um, makeup of the of the country and we're even seeing that with some of the new um, Syrian refugee families and I I don't mean to gloss over the, the the fact that integration for them is is very difficult but some have already started businesses in Canada and are um, actually em employing uh, Canadians in some of the small towns that have sponsored them and so if these stories can continue it may not be a, a trouble free path but it's certainly one that that uh, we hope will will continue to have um, more positive rather than negative um, stories unfold. Okay, Mr. Surya Narayana. I'm from ISAS. Uh, as you might be well aware, there is tension between China and India, you know, in Bhutan, with Bhutan claiming that the standoff is on Bhutanese territory and China saying it's on Chinese territory. Of course, you are on the other side of the globe, but what are the 
viewpoints, if any, or what is the perception of Canada on this issue, if at all? Has Canada really addressed this issue in its foreign policy perspective? And secondly, uh, there was some talk about an Arctic future for Canada uh, with global warming and the ice melting in the Arctic. Does Canada see it as a challenge of climate change or as an opportunity for economic uh, you know, linkages with China, Japan through a shorter route? Thank you. Um, on, the, on the Arctic, um, it's, it's certainly as in addition to the Atlantic Pacific, we are an, also an Arctic nation. We're watching very closely what's happening. We're uh, an active member in the Arctic Council and, in fact, um, supported Singapore's request to become an observer to the Council because of our appreciation for the fact that what's happening in the Arctic and, and global warming has an impact on um, small uh, island states and as well as the commercial shipping lines and so on. I, I would say um, it is the Arctic, is the what's happening in the Arctic. Um, I, I wouldn't see it um, necessarily as a one or the other, I think, um, in terms of, of a problem or an opportunity. Um, certainly the, the, the climate implications are, are um, being viewed very seriously by the Canadian government and the contributions that we are trying to make to tackle and combat climate change are relevant um, very much um, as being something that we're watching and, and working to uh, hope that, that the melting will, will be able to subside. We would not be um, seeing the, the idea of, of, of a, perhaps a new shipping line heading through um, the Arctic as being um, s such a priority that we would, re we would not want the, uh, the, to combat the, the forces that are creating those, those shipping lines. But like others, we would seek to protect um, Canadian interests if um, it does become a, a situation where there are um, uh, some ice-free routes. We would be looking to uh, ensure that those are done in a way um, that protects Canadian interests as well as the environmental implications of having shipping pass through um, through the Arctic. So it's an area that, through our work on the Arctic Council, as as well as through um, uh, talking with other interested. Um, Arctic uh, players, uh, we will continue to watch that that and participate very closely. Um, as a sidebar, I'll say that um, Finland is the um, chairing the Arctic Council this year, and so t t the ambassador of Finland and I are planning, along with our colleagues from the MFA in Singapore, to put on an Arctic panel in the fall. Um, so I'll be sure to share that okay. information. Um, and while the, the it'll have somewhat of a cultural component as well as a, as a more academic substantive component, um, I think given Singapore's interest, some of these issues of the uh, the commercial but also climate change implications will come out at that event. So would welcome your participation there. I confess I can't speak on the um, on the Bhutan issue with any um, a any authority. So uh, I will have to um, I'll have to decline an uh, opportunity on to comment on 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 that one. No, that yeah. question was asked presumably in anticipation of uh, Canada's membership of the Security Council, right? <laughs> okay, uh, this is just a presumption on my part. Uh, Mr. Chaturvedi. Thank you, uh, my question is related to the... Yeah, the mic, microphone, please, yeah. Uh, my question is related to Canadian uh, contribution towards developmental research. IDRC is, uh, which is a crown corporation, is third largest development donor agency in the world. But in last couple of years, its funding is shrinking. And it had earlier offices in Singapore also, which has been merged with its Delhi office uh, in last few years. So how do you see? And one of the uh, recent initiative, think tank mm -hmm. initiative, which has helped a lot of think tanks in Asia to do research, which is focused more on few sectors you uh, highlighted in your talk. So how this uh, development uh, research focus is shifting in Canada? If can set light on that. No, thank you. Thank you, and and yes, um, our IDRC has had a a, a long and I, I think productive history in in the region. I was fortunate enough to participate um, here at NUS at the business school. Um, IDRC funded just uh, a couple of months ago a ASEAN um, 
workshop on supply chains in, in ASEAN. Um, and so that was an IDRC and US um, initiative. And IDRC is active right now in planning to, we hope, partner with Singapore on, um, on a project in, in Myanmar as well. So IDRC is still engaged. The funding, you're correct, has shifted. Um, uh, partly under the under the previous uh, government, but it is still um, in existence and still is a thriving institution. What I would say is where, where you may see um, some expansion um, and, and a, I won't say redirection, but a focus for IDRC will be aligning itself with the new international assistance policy that I mentioned announced by Minister Bibo, which will have more of a focus on gender um, equality and women and girls. And so there could be some direction of IDRC into looking how um, some of its projects in the region could lead to the advancement of interests of women and girls. It doesn't mean that the, the benefits would not flow to uh, other members of the of the population but the the idea of the government is that if you raise um the uh the economic ability and interests of women and girls you raise the the likelihood of positive results for the rest of the of the society so that could be something that where idrc um, expands its efforts. There was, I, I um, understand, a, an ASEAN center that IDRC was involved with that was based here in Singapore. That's probably the one you're referring to. At the present time, there has not been plans announced to reopen um, that in, in Singapore, but we are supporting, for example, um, and IDRC has been involved, is the uh, infrastructure center of excellence here in Singapore. Um, as well through our ASEAN mission based in Jakarta, IDRC is working quite a lot with them in terms of other projects in the region. So I'd be happy to share a bit more information uh, in due course if you're interested. Okay, time for second bites now. Uh, oh, sorry, I, Madam, you, you, yeah, okay. Ask. Thank you for joining us, Commissioner. Um, my name is Sarah Lazar from the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. Uh, I have two questions, actually. And the first one, I think, um, is going to touch on some of our, the elephant in the room, so to speak, or the elephant back home, I suppose. Uh, and what's been tickling the elephant and what's been creating a lot of uh, challenges in this particular area of the region, a, of the world, rather, is growing inequality. Uh, and I wonder, Commissioner, if you could comment on if Canada is going to now put women and girls at the center of aid policy, should we also not consider looking at put, putting them at the center of trade policy as well? Uh, because if we're going to empower young women and girls and if we're going to start to breach those inequalities, uh, then I wonder what do we have in store in terms, if we're not just talking about aid in terms of you know, a handout and, and our, or a hand up rather, but if we're talking about true empowerment, should we be talking about a different way of doing trade where we are linking it to policies that lift up uh, economic situations of the people who don't receive as much as the people who will receive from the top, <coughs> from the top, excuse me, particularly in regions where the inequality is very, very stark, and the Asia Pacific happens to be one of those regions. Uh, so that's the first question. And the second question, uh, you touched on the desire for Canadians to, or for the Canadian government rather, and Canadians in general, I suppose, to have uh, more rules-based or to have more enforcement of rules and adherence to rules. And I wonder if we should sometimes look in our backyard, will Canada be more stringent as it is an exporter of arms about who it sells arms to? And I think the highlight that I that always comes to mind for me is, is Saudi Arabia. Are, will we be able to say, mm, no, at this point, the money is not as important as perhaps the abuses that are being committed with Canadian products. Uh, so if you would share your thoughts on that, I'd be very grateful. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, thank okay. you very you much. Got questions? Yes, yeah. okay. yes. Um, so first on, on the um, your comments regarding the expansion, if I characterize it correctly, so in, in achieving Canada's goals of increasing the, the um, opportunities and benefits for women and girls and therefore reducing inequality through other mechanisms uh, apart from solely international assistance. And I would say that, that that's um, absolutely uh, the, the, the case, is that the, the focus on um, gender equality and 
increasing the opportunities for women and girls, in fact, infuses across the policies of the government um, as opposed to being restricted only to international assistance. Um, in terms of a couple of e examples um, to, to, to bring in the, the comment about about trade and trade engagement is there have been um, a number of projects that have been supported by the Canadian government to increase the ability, uh, particularly of women entrepreneurs in the region, to create their micro um, and small and medium enterprises. Um, so in these ones, they a few have been targeted directly at women, others have been targeted at um, not exclusively at women-owned businesses, but recognizing that in many of the countries it's women that own the micro-enterprises. And so through uh, Canada's support for, um, uh, through APEC um, and also through some ASEAN initiatives, that has been um, one, of the, one of the goals. And I think um, it's fair to say that uh, we, we feel that it's achieving that, that goal of, um, of, of reducing or reducing inequality through opening up more opportunities for women to access into the um, the, the trading networks of the of the countries in 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 the region um, in in addition um, there's been efforts in terms of um, on the education access to education access to opportunity again with the idea that by um, by increasing the the ability of women to um, to to connect into um, opportunities and the and the economy, you therefore um, raise the income level of their families and reduce inequality in in that fashion. Um, on the so that's on the sort of trade, but not trade policy specifically. I, I'd say on the trade policy specifically, um, again, um, through um, incorporation of uh, labor standards in Canada's free trade agreements is one way that we are trying to address um, and ensure that that the, the trade that results, we hope, from the agreements is one that's inclusive um, as opposed to only benefiting the the, um, a small fraction of the population, uh, and and so th this has been. Um, it, it may seem um, a, like a, a passing reference, but I, I can I can attest to the fact that uh, the Trudeau government and his cabinet work also as a um, very much as a collective and cohesive um, body, and so they will talk about gender issues around the. The cabinet table, in terms of as policies are implemented, to make sure that it's not simply siloed in international assistance, but it cuts across um, policies. So, should Canada be um, chosen and fortunate enough to take on a seat at the UN Security Council in 2021-22, and should Prime Minister Trudeau still <laughs> be in power at that time, I think you, you would see that as being a large part of what we'd be seeking to contribute in that regard. Um, on the issue of arms trade, of course, uh, without being able to, to speak to specifics of particular transactions, um, it there is similar to the in, in foreign investment coming into Canada for for um, export control transactions. There there is a review process that takes that takes place, um, and that that is run through um, the government to look through a transaction before it it, it, it proceeds. Um, I, I can't speak to the specifics of the of um, the transactions uh, that have happened in in the recent past, um, but I would I would say that um, that there is uh, an awareness that um, you 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 cannot view a transaction in exclusion to the uh, to the other policy objectives that you're trying to achieve. Okay. Yes, sir. Would you indulge me to ask a non-IASA question? Please. Because I'm not, I, 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 there's often time, one thing is always push the margin and forgotten, the people. Oh, could yeah. you say we that one more time? We talk about trade, we talk about foreign policy, mm. we talk about all sorts of things, but the people somehow is always left to the margin or forgotten, people right? People are marginalized. Okay. Yeah. So I would like to talk about two eyes with you, if, you may, if I may. Yeah? Uh, I spent about 10 years in Canada. I've got only one Indian friend. And when I say Indian friend, I mean indigenous mm. northern Indian friend. It was quite shocking for me because 
he didn't have any other friend. Uh, and, and I suppose there was some infinity between him, himself and me because I was quite new to Canada. I was going through this cultural shock unconsciously, I think. So there was some sort of thing. And uh, so I want to hear from you what have Canada done in terms of including your indigenous people since the 70s, yeah? That's a long time ago. Uh, the second I is uh, identity. Um, because when I was a student there, uh, Professor Harold Edward taught me squash. And Harold is Margaret, the iconoclast by Margaret's brother. And I remember she, well, she was a professor at my college. And she used to tell people, why are we talking about the Canadian identity? There's no such thing. We're too young to have a Canadian identity. And from what you say early on, maybe she's spot on because there's still a continuous influx of Asians into the Chinese, uh, into the Canadian mosaic profile. So I'd like to hear from you the update on the including the indigenous people and really this question of whether the Canadian has an identity or not yet. Thank you. Okay. okay. <laughs> okay. Not easy, but no, 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 this is fine. Um, it, well, uh, let me start by by saying that um, there there has been um, in in Canada similar to um, Australia, uh, New Zealand, and others a recognition that practices in the past with respect to Canada's indigenous people um, have have resulted in a situation where the the population is is um, is n is not in a in a in a place where we can look with with pride at the current time and say um, past choices were the right choices and and we've done well by our indigenous population and so for that reason um, there have been for example uh, an apology made uh, on behalf of the um, of the the government in the country to the indigenous population with respect to the residential school policy that was that was was held. Um, there's also been a, um, a national reconciliation commission launched. Um, there has been looks um, to see what can be done to increase the prospects for success um, of self-government um, and self-determination amongst Canada's indigenous population. There are, I, I always, um, you'll have to bear with me because I'm always glass half full. Um, I, I look to examples where you see um, success in a number of our indigenous communities who are um, with self-government finding um, a, a positive trajectory for themselves and their, and their people, including um, in my home province of British Columbia, um, a number of, of native bands who have um, through a combination of hard hard work, some would say a good geographical location and natural opportunity, being able to make a, a, a very viable um, and, and vibrant life for themselves and their and their communities. There's also been um, a lot of um, action taken by the part of the government to increase the educational opportunities for Aboriginal students, including to reshape curriculum in such a way that can keep and attract um, Indigenous students um, through their years of high school and, and, and beyond. Um, is it perfect? Um, no, um, but, it's, uh, but it's not hidden under the cover and it's something by choosing it, as I mentioned, as one of the four key themes of our 150th birthday, I think that shows that the government is committed to, to continue to work um, towards um, as, as so reconciliation um, with our indigenous population and, and, and moving it forward in a, in a way that, that helps them become part of that mosaic of Canada. On the question of identity, I'm just smiling because, of course, with um, you know Singapore being uh, uh, 52 years old and one and coming with its same questions of what does it mean to be Singaporean? Um, yes, I mean part of the identity is the fact is that Canada is a nation of of, of immigrants, and I, I think that um, in 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 part is 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 what we celebrate um, and the fact that we are um, a diverse nation. We're a young nation. Um, as I mentioned before, we we had tended in the past to define ourselves as what we're not. We're not, you know, we're not British. We're not American. Um, maybe that's a bit of the of the cliched sort of um, Canadian way of of of, of uh, 
complementing ourselves by by contrast as opposed to defining our own identity. I, as I mentioned, I think the part of the theme of the government in 150 was to try and say, okay, let's think about what we what we are. Um, and you'll notice that in the themes, they're they're forward looking in terms of youth, in terms of environment, in terms of reconciliation, in terms of diversity inclusion. So I, I'd say it's a probably uh, continue to watch as the identity involves. Do we see it as a problem? Not necessarily. I mean, there's uh, there, we're not a a nation that that um, always is kind of has to be out there shouting at the rooftops. We're, we're Canadian. I've discovered a lot of Canadians in Singapore who have merged and, and um, integrated very well into the Singapore community where you just discover they're Canadian, you know, four or five um, meetings later. And that's that's fine. You know, that's not that's not a, a, a problem. Um, but uh, it's 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 uh, I think it's an identity that is is perhaps continuing to evolve as our country grows and as new waves of immigrants um, contribute to the fabric of the of the nation. Okay, second by time, uh, Professor. Yeah. Hi, Commissioner. I would take advantage of the uh, Chatham House rules to ask some very specific questions. Okay, and I will try my best. <laughs> Um, the Institute of South Asian Studies has on its mandate South Asia, that's from Afghanistan, India, Pakistan, Nepal, Bhutan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Maldives, and that, that's the part of the world I'm talking about. As you know, uh, this part of the world has some major problems like uh, nuclearization and nuclear competition between India and Pakistan and proliferation of uh, nuclear um, technology beyond and the possibility of their falling into um, dangerous hands. Then there is a problem of terrorism, homegrown and imported. This region houses uh, most Muslims than other parts of the world. And finally, immigration and migration. And the migrants from India found a home in uh, Canada but then they wanted to transform the home that they left behind. I'm not talking about Sikh migration and Khalistan. Mm. As you might know, when the foreign minister visited India, the chief minister of uh, Punjab was not very keen to receive him. Because the issue was the murder of Indira Gandhi by two Sikh uh, bodyguards. So there was an issue, uh, Indian style, they hushed it up. The question to you is, is there an understanding between Canada and India with regard to um, Khalistan movement, with regard to anti-terrorist cooperation in terms of intelligence sharing, or any treaty to hand over to India um, people who committed crimes in India and have gotten shelter in Canada. So on these contentious issues, the United States takes clear positions. The Can uh, Canada doesn't always take clear positions. Is that deliberate policy or is it the Canadian way? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, uh, I, will, I will again um, s s say that um, uh, unlike my uh, my, my colleague, the High Commissioner in, 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 in Delhi and our representation in, in Pakistan and so on, I'm not, um, I'm, I'm not as well briefed on all of these issues as they, as they would be. Um, what I would say is, is that Canada is very um, aware of the, of the threat of, of terrorist activity um, that can be homegrown, um, that can come from our immigrant population, but also that's happening in the, in the region. And it's something that um, is, is viewed uh, very seriously, and there are efforts to uh, to try to contribute to the work that's being done in the region to combat um, the and work towards anti uh, or counterterrorism capacity building. So I'll give one example where through um, right now our, our former commissioner of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police is working um, has just arrived and is working at Interpol on various counterterrorism capacity building initiatives that stretch um, beyond the region but are very much focused um, on the region and uh, some of the initiatives such as Project Sunbird have, have um, increased the amount of, of intelligence and information sharing and confidence building within the respective intelligence networks and customs and border, um, you know, including South Asia, but 
focused um, right now m primarily on ASEAN that have, have led to very concrete results. And so that's something that I think we, we look to continue to do. Um, I, the funding for that project has just been um, re, um, re-instigated for another three or four years, which is very positive. Um, I think it's, it's also an ongoing process to be aware of what's happening within the various communities back in Canada, and it doesn't necessarily um, depend solely on the, um, or it's not how solely in our um, immigrant uh, or ethnic communities, it also can, can arise um, across what you would say to be a, um, a, a true land Quebecois or a you know an Anglo Canadian as well who decide to to take an, an action either abroad or within Canada that that is um, is unfortunately of a, you know of a, a, a terrorist nature that that that's something that the, the country looks um, very and our 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 police and intelligence services are very very focused on on combating. Um, in terms of the the, the general um, policy on uh, on India Pakistan, I, I think I will um, I will take the uh, op opportunity oh, to, to, to to pass I, on that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Actually, also there is another point, though, High Commissioner. Mm. I mean, there there could be some legal issues. I don't think Canada or Canadian courts will extradite to countries where there is death penalty. That, that death penalty exists. That is, that so is there is a immediate structural problem there extradition but they wouldn't do it America has no such constraints no such values also but in Canada as in Europe it is difficult uh, Mr. Juma boy replies to all these questions I just wanted to ask you about immigration into Canada versus immigration interested into, into Australia uh -huh. Mm. In Australia, the English convicts were sent to Australia, but they were, as you know, the historical thing. Is there any comparison to that? Were, 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 were such people also uh, sent to Canada at that time? This was, I think, the uh, Victorian era? Yeah, actually, uh, no. We, we did not have that same pattern of convict um, sort of conscription and, and being sent to uh, where they were sent to colonize Australia. No, the, the pattern of immigration, um, of the sort of British immigration early to, into Canada was more people seeking to um, to immigrate for economic reasons to uh, for to start farming to, um, uh, so no convict immigration I into, into, into it was Canada. British and French. And and of course the yes it's we have two founding uh, founding nations so it was yeah. New France and and you know and uh, thank you I, and I had the pleasure as a young man of meeting the first Mr Trudeau ah. in the Raffles Hotel after oh. the war wow <laughs> <laughs> okay uh, would there be any other questions if not I'll okay uh, Dipinder uh, yes this is the second bite question, yeah if I may. Uh, you mentioned one of the four banks is gender parity. To put it mildly, South Asia has an extremely poor track record on that count, and India is, again, it's, it's things are getting worse, actually. Uh, because that's, that's what the government's own data shows on uh, adolescent girls' health, literacy, labor force, mm. participation rates. I mean, that's been on a secular downward trend. How does, you, you mentioned gender parity is a, is, is, is a major plank on which uh, determines foreign aid and uh, technical assistance. How does it actually get incorporated and move past uh, the state based system platitude? Sure, it's, it's not seen as a prerequisite. In other words, um, you don't need the parity in order to get the assistance. It's more uh, what, what projects and which partners would we be able to work with and what innovative approaches to international assistance would increase the opportunities for women and girls is seen or the empowerment of women and girls the the the, the parity was more um prime minister trudeau's decisions with respect to his own you know cabinet and representation so he he sees it i suppose and he was quoted as saying you know because it's 2016 this is why we're 
this is why we're doing this. Um, I think he succeeded at setting a, an example which which maybe other countries may may wish to follow. But in terms of incorporation into policy, the I, the idea is more less a, as a, as I say less a prerequisite and more a goal to to focus our international assistance towards the projects that have the most chance of of, of leading to greater empowerment of of women and girls and gender equality. Okay, uh, a final uh, question from the chair, if I may. Uh, uh, this relates to this uh, Pierre Trudeau's uh, sleeping with an elephant mm. uh, 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 allegory. Um, there are two common sense ways of reacting to, to the elephant. One is to tack very close to the elephant in order not to be trampled. Uh, the other is to just move away. Uh, the the uh, foreign minister's speech that you mentioned and the contents uh, such as rule-based order and uh, open trading system uh, appears to be very different. I mean, and, and very quickly different from what uh, what what the U.S. positions on these issues have been. Uh, even yesterday, as late as yesterday. Uh, uh, there was a Canadian reaction, I think, to uh, transgender induction into the armed forces. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, forces. So, is uh, could one extrapolate that the current option is to move as far away from the elephant as possible, and does safety in in perception uh, of of those who make policy lies in in this distance? That's it. Interesting observation, and I, <laughs> I, w I would say um, my answer to that would would be um, f first is that there's still, and and I I hope this came across in my comments on the U.S. There's still a, a lot of of um, optimism that when you are talking to, for example, um, the the U.S. Uh, business and commercial interests, there's an appreciation for the benefits that have arrived from our integrated um, economy. And we are hopeful that in the conversations that are happening with the US administration and with our solid um, partners in the US, that there'll, there'll be a realization on the, on the US part that where Canada is going is not you know, contrary to their interests, but in fact, you know, could could marry up with their their interests. Um, on the on the issue of some of the of the statements where it looks like Canada is is diverging, and certainly it's it's true that on some issues we 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 are. I, I think from the perspective of our government, um, again, it, it's, n it's not being done to contrast ourselves with the U.S., it's more being done to pursue our own national values and, 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 and interests. Um, ha having said that, there is certainly uh, on, the, on the trade and commercial side an appreciation by the government that we do need to diversify, um, and, and that's part of the reason why we're looking to, um, to Asia. Um, South Asia, Southeast Asia, North Asia as as the logical partners to um, to pursue on the commercial side, and, and also as as partners on some of the multilateral and security and defense initiatives. So it's maybe um, uh, it, I I wouldn't say the strategy is to distance from the U.S. Although in in some of the um, simply by pursuing our, our our values and national interest, and you marry that against some of the statements coming from the U.S. It it, it the, the contrast can seem quite stark at, at, at times, but my m my point is is that I th it's it's being done with a vision as to what our what's in Canada's interest as opposed to trying to contrast ourselves against the United States. Well, thank yeah. thank you, High Commissioner. Uh, we are hitting uh, 4:30 nearly. Thank you very much for an excellent uh, uh, dis uh, uh, discussions and also for your role in in being very forthright in this Q and A Q and A session. Not all the questions were easy, but uh, uh, the job of a high commissioner is not meant to be <laughs> easy. With regard to the, uh, the last uh, point, today, today uh, I'm going to hand over to uh, Professor Mitra to say, give his vote of thanks uh, uh, very soon. But I just want to make this uh, 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 story. I'll tell you this story. Uh, knowing that I'll host you today, I think someone came into a room and left a piece of paper, left a piece of paper, and it's a joke. Normally, uh, uh, country-directed uh, jokes are critical. And uh, this one see seemed to be in praise of Canada. So I'll read it out. Now, this contrasts with, uh, again, what's, what's happening below you. And this is a cartoon of a little girl uh, uh, asking her mother, uh, Mommy, what's a Canadian? 
and Pat comes to reply from the mother. Uh, it's an unarmed North American with health insurance, sweetie. <laughs> <laughs> so with those, with those words, uh, Professor Mitra, you have the floor. <laughs> Ambassador Chaudhary, distinguished High Commissioner of Canada, distinguished High Commissioners of Pakistan and Sri Lanka, who has had to leave, distinguished members of the... I'm sorry. I also have to <laughs> apologize. Yeah. I welcome you very much. Distinguished members of the Singapore Civil Society, Mr. Chandaria Sri Jimabhai, distinguished audience, and members of the ISIS family. Um, it was not always like this, but the ambassador's talk during the two years uh, of my being here have really become the high point of our working life. And I have to thank you and other high commissioners who have made this possible. When I was an undergraduate, I was told, what is a diplomat? He is an honest man who is sent abroad to lie for his country. <laughs> First of all, they just don't send men anymore. <laughs> Second, I could never imagine you lying. <laughs> At first you would say, I don't know. That's the honest truth. And a think tank like ours needs that access, needs that conviviality, and needs the respect for secrecy and confidentiality, which is the only way a think tank can do its job properly. I uh, would strongly encourage you to take up the offer of uh, Ambassador Chaudhary if you want to spell out the excellent points that emerged today and your excellent responses to them in the form of a, uh, an insight paper. And uh, our, we have also found the method of clearance. The Bangladesh High Commissioner has recently published something with us to spell out what uh, my colleague uh, Dipinder so elegantly formulated as uh, a global role model. Mm -hmm. That's what your country is. I've known it for four years as a graduate student in Rochester, when you would look wistfully across the frontier towards your country <laughs> as a civilized country. Now, um, this is what came out, and that will be part of my takeaway today, the achievements of this uh, country tucked away in the far north. And with the social security of European standards, and at the same time, the efficiency of American standards. I mean, that's the combination in every area, giving representation, giving welfare, assuring public services, Canada is a role model, and that certainly is uh, something to mention and glory about. Our papers are sent away to 14,000 stakeholders all over the world. That's our distribution list, and that's the least we can do to you and to other ambassadors, other high commissioners, other very busy diplomats who give the time to come here during a working day. The least we could do is to become a little sounding board for you, for you to send out a message. Thank you, Thank you very much for that. The second thing I got from you today, um, in response to very close questioning, is how different Canada is from the United States in terms of not giving in to the temptation of self-help, but to go for global governance. Mm to work through multilateral organization. That's what global citizens do. And if one doesn't have a position, it simply means one waits for the global community to come up with a position and follow it, which is what we do within democratic countries. So democracy within, but anarchy outside has been the North American way. Canada is an excellent exception one has to celebrate it. The third point that came out was identity. You are absolutely right to say that even after 150 years, one has to ask, because identity is not a once and for all thing at all. It evolves, mm -hmm. which is why the Institute of South Asian Studies has two parallel projects to ask, what is Pakistan after 70 years of Pakistan about? What is India after 70 years of independence about? Is the story of Pakistan the story of an unraveling of the idea of Pakistan or its obstinate resilience? What is India about? Is it about inclusive Indian culture or Indic culture or angry, exclusive, uh, deformed Hinduism, which is dogmatic? So this is how 
Canada also asked that question. And I had the joy of serving with a very distinguished Canadian uh, called Ron Watts, a global political scientist who taught me that uh, it's about self-rule and fair rule. That's how Canada has invented the combination of federalism and consociationalism. Mm -hmm. I can't imagine the, North, um, the United States equivalent of a reconciliation commission or the respect that Canada extends to difference, la différence. That is how the French stayed away from the call of de Gaulle <laughs> to let Quebec join France. And that is what, as a political scientist, I've learned mm -hmm. from how to combine majoritarianism with respect for minorities. So that's all very good. And uh, all the problems that my generation had uh, struggled with to find answers for apparently have been answered, but not quite. If they are all answered, the think tank will have nothing else to do. <laughs> so we must also have some work to do. And that we do in terms of doing our project, making our publications, and occasionally coming up with books. So I would uh, like to appreciate your giving your time to us in t by giving you a couple of gifts. We only serve food that we have cooked ourselves. So the first gift would be an excellent book on the United Nations and the WTO, a South Asian perspective by whom? Oh. The person is sitting next to you, Ambassador Itikar Ahmad Chaudhary. That's your first gift. Second, we all need a touch of smart diplomacy. That's also from one of my colleagues, Mr. Surya Narayana. With this, I would like to hand over to your gift. And Hi Commissioner, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Should I give a round of uh, I invite you to give a round of applause to the High Commissioner. And invite you to some tea outside and uh, further interactions. Thank you. The time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much.